to our first City Forum uh, event of the spring. Uh, we did have a City Forum planned earlier, but Dr. West, to be from Australia, had to cancel the last minute, for sort of fires and plagues and so on. Um, so um, it's my real pleasure today to introduce um, um, an old friend uh, and really a leader uh, in the planning field. Dr. Jeffrey Lowe, and I'll just say a few things. Um, he's an associate professor uh, at the Urban Planning and Environmental Policy School at Texas Southern University in Houston. Um, his research and scholarship focuses broadly <coughs> on community development, and he's done a lot of really uh, pioneering work uh, on community land trusts as a community development approach and tool. He's done a lot of really interesting work interesting work on kind of post-Katrina recovery um, issues. Um, and um, um, today he's going to talk about what we all know and recognize is an obvious fundamental problem in planning. And that is people in the planning, planning academy and people in planning practice do not look like or have lived experiences <coughs> that connect us to many of the communities that we are planning for and with. Um, so Dr. Lowe has been like a real leader uh, in diversity efforts in the planning field, both on the academic side and the practice side. Um, he uh, helped found and was leader for uh, Planners of Color's interest group in ACSP, which is the kind of academic planning uh, community organization. Um, and he's also um, chair of the Black Community Division of the American Planning Association, more on the practice side. So Dr. Lowe's going to talk about how we might reflect on the history and the kind of current realities in the planning field in regards to diversity and uh, how we might drive uh, change uh, toward a more diverse profession. So. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. I think I should really begin this uh, presentation just by storytelling, and I think as I go through it, most of what I present will probably be that, or at least lean towards uh, that direction. I've had the privilege um, in my career to be a faculty member and instructor at a number of planning institutions. And I tend to teach in the core, the planning theory and history uh, courses. And inevitably, typically, when I uh, teach those courses at the conclusion, or even sometimes when I'm not teaching, but you know, as faculty, often we gain rapport with students, and sometimes they're very comfortable in asking the question. You know, I've learned about Daniel <coughs> I've learned about Jane Jacobs, and others who have had a particular impact on the course of planning. But where are people who look like me? Where are the African Americans? What impact have they had? Uh, certainly this is uh, Black History Month. And again, I, I really appreciate being here. I want to share with you, as we kind of move through um, this history, if you will, what particularly the first generation, I, I, that's what I call it, the first generation of African American planners, what impact that they've had on um, the field. Some of these uh, figures, uh, as I have entitled my talk, figures, facts, and perspectives, in terms of the uh, uh, subtitle. Some of these um, individuals, you probably um, have read the works, are you familiar with? Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's a question that as we typically 
think about planned history, most of us are, un are unable to answer. And I, I hope at least this could be the beginning of the conversation, that we can answer some of those questions and really think about um, the contribution that they made to the field. So to begin, we start with uh, Sam Colors. Planning certainly is a progressive era profession. <coughs> uh, many of you would probably have taken planning history. You know the first plan, uh, city plan or comprehensive plan was the plan of Chicago uh, in 1909. And we usually typically signal that as the beginning of the planning profession. Um, it was almost five decades later, it was almost five decades later that the, the first African-American trained as a professional planner comes on the scene. Uh, Sam Colors uh, received his uh, master in city and regional planning in 1952. Um, his undergraduate degree, as you can see here, was at uh, Fisk. And he spent most of his career uh, in Hartford, Connecticut with the Redevelopment Authority there. Uh, this was particularly in the time when urban renewal uh, began to rise, and he also did work around community renewal, working with the Community Renewal Authority in uh, Canada, in Toronto. Uh, he began to do uh, work also um, in other countries, such as uh, uh, Asian countries, such as uh, Thailand at that time. And so he uh, was very active uh, in the field and as you can see being the director of the Sacramento Valley uh, section of the California APA. He was also um, quite active in the professional organization. Now, I included Robert Weaver here because Robert Weaver was not a planner. He was not a planner. But he had a significant impact on the field of planning. Being the first secretary of HUD, um, HUD was created in 1965, or approved by Congress, certainly in 1965, under the Johnson administration. And what's important to note here with Weaver, he implemented the Model Cities program. Now you may have heard much about Model Cities um, as being a part of the Great Society uh, programs and with model cities a number of African Americans who later would become mayors or public administrators first received their training particularly with planners there was uh, uh, an offshoot or uh, a plan or program implementation known as the 701 program. It was through the 701 program that many planners during that era received their training. African American planners and women planners in particular. And as a result of that training, we begin to see a greater cadre or critical mass of black planners coming on the scene. Uh, the 701 program uh, stayed around until about the, um, some remnants of it certainly, 
it began to dwindle in, in funds as uh, model cities uh, began to become um, and great, the great society programs in general became less uh, popular. Uh, however, around the time of the Reagan administration, the uh, 701 program uh, ceased to exist. It was morphed into um, what was known as the Community Development Work Study Program. And, and while the funding was lessened uh, through the Community Development Work Study Program, you know, there was some presence. And that pretty much lasted um, on until about the time of the Bush administration uh, senior. Henry Cisneros uh, was the last Secretary of HUD uh, to support uh, the community development uh, work study program. Uh, so, again, I am including Robert Weaver here because this is where you begin to see during this period, and because of the support of this program, you begin to see African Americans and, and women uh, coming, emerging in the field. Charles Allen <clears throat> was the, and, and certainly things change, but Charles Allen is considered the first African American planning director of a major city. Uh, and I say times change and of course places change because today we might look at Gary, Indiana and we wouldn't say that it was a major city. But if you were to go back in time, uh, many people would argue and say that it was Gary that built the state of Indiana because of all of its steel uh, manufacturing that took place um, on the lake. It was also a time of transition. Um, where we see the first African-American mayor of a major city, uh, Hatcher, Mayor Hatcher, take the reins. And he hired uh, Charles Allen. As you can see here, uh, Charles received his undergraduate degree from Hampton University in Virginia. And he received his uh, Master of Urban Planning in 1963 from Columbia University. Along with, I should mention, along with being the first mayor of a major city, the few planners that were around um, at that time, he was one that was also involved in other um, activities. During the Civil Rights Movement, uh, there was a, a, a certainly a move through uh, uh, for self-determination. Um, to rid of uh, oppression. And he was also the planning director of a small place in North Carolina known as Soul City. So he began to lay the efforts in uh, the groundwork um, uh, in Soul City. Later, he goes back to his home city of Newport News, Virginia becomes the deputy planning director there, serves as mayor uh, for uh, about, uh, deputy mayor, excuse me, for about 18 years, and, um, and, and, and retires from there. So he was truly had a commitment to planning, to trying to make places uh, better and, and, and public public service. I included here um, the American Society of Planning Officials, and that becomes uh, really important. The American Planning, the American Society of Public Officials, or ASPO, was actually the forerunner of APA. 
APA was, is actually a result in the late 70s, around 78, 79, um, is the result of a merger between ASPO and AIP. So just for a little interaction here, um, who can imagine or who knows what AIP was? Yes, the American Institute of Planners. And probably many of you here in this room will hope to gain or will attempt and probably be successful in getting your certification as a practicing, uh, as a practicing planner. What's interesting to note was that AIP was always a technical arm, right, to promote the field. However, ASPO had more of a dedication to, to social planning and recognized, uh, even at that time, the importance of having voices from diverse communities. And so they ensured that there were certain slots on their board for uh, communities of color and women that were appointed to the board. And uh, hence, Charles Allen was one of those appointees. As the merger began to occur between AIP and ASPO to create APA, of course, they had to agree on bylaws. They had to come up with what was appropriate, the types of appropriate bylaws. And one of the things that was lost in the bylaw creation was appointments to the board. And we begin to see that um, African Americans no longer held representation at the same time and you know planning is a field that where we try to work through tensions and at the same time as APA was formed there was also seen as a desire that African Americans still needed to maintain a presence and so um, they um, if you will fought and pushed and decided to create uh, the planning and the community uh, division. If I can go back, the forerunner of the uh, planning in the black community division was the National Association of Planners. I am still trying to gather um, more information um, about uh, the national, the NAP, as it uh, is familiarly called. Uh, at this juncture, uh, I, I, uh, it comes up in interviews and conversations. However, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to, and through archives and what have you, unable to come across uh, much information uh, about NAP. But, uh, uh, NAP today would probably be equivalent to other autonomous um, black organizations such as the National Association of Black Architects right? or the, uh, the National Federation of Blacks in Public Accounting. They gave up their autonomy, if you will, and decided to become a part of the collective of the The persons who um, led that uh, movement are Rod Lee Proctor and Bill Harris. They were planning students at the University of Washington 
in the 1960s. Uh, Bill Harris, who has an undergraduate degree from, in physics, um, actually from Howard University, to the best of my knowledge, is the first African American to gain a PhD in planning in 1964. And just as an aside, um, for those of you who are into politics and what have you, um, I will mention, perhaps the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, Melissa Harris Perry is his daughter. Um, and uh, he spent the bulk of his career um, in planning at UVA. He went on to be the founding chair of the Department of City and Regional Planning at uh, Jackson State uh, University, which today is one of four historically black colleges and universities that has a accredited planning program. So these two gentlemen um, <coughs> the, uh, the founding of the Planning in the Black Community Division uh, in 1980. At that time, there were only there was only one other population. What what uh, APA refers to as population divisions. There was only one other population division that existed at that time. Two years earlier to the founding of PBCD, um, women in planning. The women in planning division was founded. And they caught um, um, quite a bit of flack from many within APA in founding this division. Um, there were those in APA who believed um, that uh, finding, founding a division uh, dedicated uh, to uh, creating a forum for African-American planners, you know, was actually balkanization, right? And in some cases, they were perceived or called as being racist for wanting to create a division. They went on and argued uh, the need for such a division and certainly if, uh, uh, indicated that while this division is uh, focused primarily on the needs and desires of black communities, anyone could be a member. Of the anyone could be a member. And uh, the division um, at the APA conference in Cincinnati of that year uh, was uh, established. Now, I found this, and I thought it was really, um, really important. And unfortunately, this document I don't have with me. I intended to bring it with me. But there, uh, as you can see, there, again, this notion of collaboration, or at least having allies and working together, um, is very prevalent here. Um, Carol Barrett um, was the past chairperson of the Planning and Women Division at that time. Um, many of us, uh, I'm not sure if her ethics book is still used, Planning with Ethics, but uh, uh, you know, she continues to live through her work that continues to um, uh, provide us uh, some guidance and uh, planning ethics. Paul Davidoff. Paul Davidoff was, uh, as you know, um, uh, his famous work around advocacy planning is really seen to be a major uh, theoretician um, in our field. He went on, Paul Davidoff went on to establish the Department of Urban Affairs and Planning uh, at Hunter College in New York, and uh, in 1970, if I can go back, 
this gentleman here becomes a faculty member from about 1970 uh, to 1978. Can you imagine the power that was going on in that department? And I should also mention when it comes to um, trying to encourage diversity and, and bringing people <coughs> into planning, which, which again, uh, Weaver and Davidoff found to be um, really important. Uh, I have come across in the archives uh, a number of black newspapers, um, such as the Amsterdam News in New York City, where they had advertisements encouraging students to pursue their masters in urban planning. So I wanted to list, you know, the three primary objectives. You saw the purpose of the PDCD, and I wanted to list the three primary objectives of PBC and how over the years they have attempted to carry out those objectives. And mind you, for the most part, on average, PBCD's uh, uh, membership on average has been less than uh, 100 individuals. Um, uh, that number. Um, ebbs, ebbs and flows. Uh, again, I would argue that they really <coughs> boost um, over the years because of the resources and their efforts in, in garnering uh, uh, members, uh, black planners in particular. They have, uh, beginning uh, particularly in the 90s, um, as you can see here, they had a forum at, at the Malcolm X Community College in um, Chicago, um, Illinois. I think, in fact, that was covered by um, CNN. And uh, this is, I think, is important in the respect that how others can learn from others, if you will. Uh, after this forum, uh, APA began to have, for a moment, APA began to have community uh, forums as well. Uh, in North Carolina, um, this is an example of members within PDCD working directly with uh, communities. Uh, this was a community in, in North Carolina that uh, experienced uh, flooding, a low-lying area. In many black communities, it probably would be what is known as the bottoms, right? The bottoms. And uh, certainly, um, last but not least, I included a vision um, for Broadway, which was a uh, technical assistance that uh, PBCD carried out in partnership with the with the uh, the Black Architects, the National Association of Black Architects, uh, to come up with a plan that would help the city of of, of Gary. <clears throat> Another intent of uh, or objective of PBCD was to facilitate leadership opportunities within APA. And uh, Ed Blakely was the first person um, to serve on the APA board. Uh, APA, uh, excuse me, Ed Blakely, some of you may know of his work, um, certainly in planning um, around economic development. Uh, community economic development, and uh, he was known uh, during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, he was in New Orleans, and he had the title of czar of um, uh, Katrina uh, revitalization efforts. 
So here you can see um, certain movement um, of people into uh, leadership uh, positions uh, in APA. At some point, and, and there are a number of people that I in, did not include that were appointed or nominated, excuse me, were nominated, but they never gained um, uh, enough votes in election to make it uh, to the board. And uh, more recently, I guess around the turn of, of, of the uh, century, the at-large seat that many members held <clears throat> was a minority-focused seat. So that's been uh, a dilemma that uh, probably more than, uh, with the exception of Blakely and um, Silver, that an organization that's 40,000 strong, if you will, uh, is often um, difficult for uh, election uh, to the board of directors. And also um, establishing networking opportunities. PBCD often had, uh, or at least you can see here, two retreats were held. But think about our goals, think about our objectives. How are we faring? Are we are getting the outcomes uh, that we desire? Um, we also began to hold um, conferences, <coughs> conferences that focused on, particularly focused on issues uh, important to African American communities, whether that be environmental justice. Um, we, at, our, at, at separate conferences held in uh, Oakland in 2003, uh, moving on uh, to uh, North Carolina at uh, East Carolina University um, was a host in Greenville, uh, North Carolina to Gary, Indiana in 07 and subsequently in, in 2010 in New Orleans. Um, these conferences were held uh, not just for networking opportunities but again to focus on issues that we found in, uh, to be important, such as criminal justice uh, in, in the black community. Um, from that conference, a, a position paper and a proposal was submitted to, my, uh, to APA that this be become a priority to talk about the impact of the prison industrial complex. And unfortunately, uh, it was it was denied, and as you can, as you know, this is a very topic, a very important topic in communities, particularly in communities of color, uh, in the black community specifically uh, today. Uh, we also, or PBCD also, began to hold uh, networking sessions in various cities across across um, the, the the country. And I think this is important because we, I think we also begin to see somewhat of a generational shift in, in somewhat of a generational shift in focus. Uh, networking certainly helps to create solidarity, but there began to be this conversation of are we having the impact on within our uh, profession? Are we continuing to have the impact in our profession uh, that, that we desire based on the past? So how are we moving from the past into, uh, into the present? And working in an organization where they're like APA, a large organization, that um, that that interest may not show up in the manner in which you desire to. Okay. 
In one of our last conferences that uh, the Planning and the Black Div Community Division held, actually the one in Gary, there were resources um, made available where PBCD wanted to begin to talk about the academy. How are planners being trained? Where are students who will be the next generation, if you will, of practitioners, where are they? And so um, the resources that were uh, made available, and I should mention here that um, uh, Norm Kromholtz, who recently passed away, um, served, was on the APA board. Um, there were also other allies like Don Kukerberg, um, a great planning historian and, and land use scholar at Rutgers who served on the board of AICP, uh, and other, and a couple of other folks. Uh, Dan Lauber, who was um, a president of APA. People who were really, I would argue, who were really dedicated to um, equity planning and worked to support um, our efforts, not just in bringing um, potential um, black graduate students uh, to the conference, but supporting the conference and many of the activities um, within uh, PDCD. After um, those um, persons left their um, positions on the board, we begin to see that somewhat change in terms of the level of support that the division uh, received. Um, and APA began to do some things more on a broader, um, take some of the ideas and incorporate them into their own work plan, right? Such as having diversity summits or encouraging different chapters to establish um, subgroups on uh, or committees on diversity. Here, this becomes important because um, there were faculty members who who were also a part of PBCD and began to really look at the at, as I call it here the state of the uh, black academy. And so in 2007, as you can see, um, roughly 4% of uh, tenured or tenure track faculty um, at the um, 86 at that time planning schools across the country only had 25 faculty. And of that number, um, 70% had their PhDs uh, in, in planning, specifically uh, in planning. And as you can see, just moving down where uh, they were placed, only one had the, uh, held the rank of associate professor during that year. And most were not in programs, for example, that had PhDs. So who's training that next generation, right? And where are they coming from? The other thing that's important to know here in, in around in the 90s, three African Americans entered the planning academy. In the next decade, that number almost tripled. However, that cohort, virtually all the members of that cohort were denied or had, uh, were denied tenure or did not fare well on third view. 
mid-career reviews. So it was, see, it was really perceived as, you know, we're in crisis here, particularly, particularly from the standpoint of, of the generation, the few uh, planning scholars um, who were at full rank. Great concern. And so, um, some of you may have heard of June Manning Thomas. Uh, June Manning Thomas, one of her classic works with uh, Marsha Ritzdorf um, in the shadows, planning in the black community, uh, planning in the black community, excuse me. She also has written uh, about um, race and redevelopment uh, in Detroit, and um, another work that came out uh, a few years ago, an edited work with, uh, with uh, Margaret Doerr, Margie Doerr, uh, The City After Abandonment. So she has a number of works there. But June was, I would, I would say that June is like the dean of the Black Planning Academy. Uh, she was the one that really worked closely um, with uh, many of the junior faculty who were experiencing uh, crisis at that uh, moment in time. And um, probably was the senior person um, to help help think through what the appropriate response should be. Now going back to PBCD, which she was also an early member, if not one of the founding members of PBCD, uh, at the joint APA-ACSP meeting, uh, that took place a year before uh, 2007 in Kansas City. Some of you all might remember that the conference was moved uh, that year from uh, where it was supposed to have been held in uh, South Carolina to support the NAACP and others in their petition at that time of holding a conference there because of the Confederate flag. Uh, controversy it was moved to Kansas City. APA, excuse me, the Planning and the Black Community Division holds a dinner. And they hold a dinner to support the efforts of the black faculty in having a meeting to talk about how do we work through this this challenge in the academy. And as the conversations pre-dinner began to happen, June makes the suggestion that we're not the only ones in this. Right? And, and I, I could go on and on because actually before this meeting, some five or six or seven years prior to this meeting, many of the black PhD students across the country are seeking out black faculty who attend ACSP. And they're meeting with them, right? And they are having dinners, they're having luncheons, powwows, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we get up to this point we also understand or we also um, recognize that um, many of our Latinx uh, brothers and sisters are having the same struggles. And so June, re June recognizing that invites uh, or spearheads others to attend this, this dinner. Thank you. And that moves us on 
She attended, some of the other faculty who were there, um, I should mention, uh, in the interest of time, um, were uh, Ed uh, Blakely, uh, Bill, uh, from Cornell. Bill Goldsmith. Goldsmith, uh, thank you, Zav Briggs, and hence we see the formulation of POSIC. Okay? June subsequently, uh, and there were others. Here's where the allies, I think, really come into play. Cheryl Content was a, a big supporter um, and formulated a committee to a task force on diversity. And that, and that task force looked at historically oppressed um, minorities, if you will, in this country, blacks, Latinos, um, Native Americans, uh, and Pacific Islanders, and what have you. Um, so while POSIC is being formed, you also see what leads to the formation of, the, of, the, of a standing committee within ACSP, known as the uh, Committee on uh, Diversity. POSIC, POSIC becomes really the advocacy <coughs> whereas the Committee on Diversity is primarily seen as the implementation arm, a way that you can uh, have more members being engaged in efforts in diversity. POSIC moves forward. They create a strategic plan, a five-year strategic plan that, uh, that sunset around nine, uh, 2016, 2017. But these were the goals of POSIC. Um, or uh, recruit and retain uh, faculty of color. And I just listed um, some of the accomplishments, right? The initiatives and programs that were created that towards that goal. Uh, a CV book um, of, of planners of color who are looking for jobs. Also faculty development and diversity um, scholarships were um, set aside um, to help people with publication and writing, uh, junior faculty. And then we also had the junior faculty of color workshop. There have been, uh, every other year, uh, 15, 17, and 19, there have been junior faculty of color workshops. Uh, to date, um, and, and for each cohort, there have been about uh, 12 faculty, approximately, for each cohort. That first cohort, of, which consisted of about 12 individuals, um, to date, and I'm, with the exception of two, all have received tenure. A market change from from uh, what we saw happening at the turn of the century. And for those who haven't received tenure, it's only because they haven't gone up yet. So we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Right. But so far, you know, if we follow baseball, you know, we're batting a thousand. And, and, and we want to certainly uh, keep that up. A goal too was to recruit and retain students of color. So there, there um, we have uh, sponsored with the support of ACSP uh, pre-doctoral workshops where we bring um, uh, about 25 students uh, together at the master's and undergraduate level together to talk to them about um, pursuing the PhD in planning. And we're seeing positive um, outcomes. Uh, from that, travel scholarships, if you will. And uh, we recently, PD POSIC, uh, recently, uh, about a couple of years ago now, completed uh, a survey of programs and applying for students. Okay? Um, the syllabi book to meet this goal 
to integrate issues of race, ethnicity, um, and justice, if you will, into planning curriculums. We've published a syllabi book um, that was updated in 2018. That's on the website. For faculty across the board, right? Uh, within uh, the uh, 90 or so uh, planning uh, programs. And certainly, um, we are on point when it comes to PAB uh, guidelines and have advocated for um, the inclusion of race and ethnicity in those guidelines. And last but not least, <clears throat> there's always, you know, we know, we hear about publish or perish, and certainly we know that that was, in many cases, for the mid-career reviews and the tenure uh, cases, that was one of the explanations that many people um, faced. And so um, we strategized. How might we do better? Uh, what can we control? What can, or better yet, maybe a better way of saying it, what can we control in, this, in an attitude or spirit of self-determination? So we said, well, um, given that some of the senior faculty uh, were there to mentor, to advise, they served on editorial boards. We began to publish amongst ourselves. At least, uh, or collectively, that's what I mean, collectively. All of these journals um, are certainly um, major journals, both at the national and international level within planning, I would dare say. Certainly, Jaber. Um, uh, housing policy debate, planning theory and practice. Um, there are at least four um, special issues that came out of POSIC conversations, sessions, and we have some individual um, publications as well uh, that the authors attribute the origination of the idea of this work coming out of Posse. So this is just, um, this is really all I have to share with you in terms of the impact that I believe uh, and the presence of of African American planners within uh, the discipline. I think that for me, uh, from a historical perspective, it raises, um, and I'm gonna close on this, and certainly have time for questions. It raises um, some thoughts, which I call my perspective. And I'd like to hear from you all on this as well. The, the, the planning as we know it, again, began in 1909 as a, as a discipline, uh, as a field. But yet it's not until five decades later that we see the first black planner emerge on the field. And so, to a very large degree, what we're really talking about here in, compar in comparison to planning in the main I think what we're really talking about is um, contemporary history. If not contemporary, certainly relatively recent um, history. That first generation of, of planners is just beginning uh, to retire. You know, for those of us in the academy, again, I shared with you uh, Bill Harris being the first uh, PhD that we know of. Um, black PhD in 1964, and I dare say, and I'm, I'm trying to do some research here, but in terms of the first African American women, woman to uh, gain a PhD in planning, it could be Jim. It could possibly be Jim, and she earned her PhD in 1977. 
So I think, you know, what does that mean? What does that say um, for us? Uh, the second thing is that while we are certainly small in number, and the statistics from uh, the data gathered by uh, the Committee on Diversity and, and subsequently by uh, ACSP, the PAB uh, report, reporting, shows that at least from um, uh, 07 to, to 2016, 17, the numbers are stagnant. I shared with you in 07, it was 4%. And in 07, the data show that there was an uptick to 5%. A few years later, um, and I'm rounding up, of course, it went up to 6%. And then it, and then it for a, a year or two, and then it declined back down to 5%. For our Latinx colleagues, it's very similar. Um, the trend, the trend appears to be um, three to four percent during that same uh, time period. Um, the only group that seems to be overrepresented, if you will, uh, whereas uh, most planners, uh, approximately seventy percent of planners are white, the only group that seems to be overrepresented based on the numbers in the population uh, uh, in terms of the planning uh, academy, it appears to be Asians. And there is conversation about a lumping effect, that many Asians are grouped together and some of them may consider themselves foreign faculty and not indigenous, if you will, to, to the US. And so, um, as I've tried to respond to my students, I think what I'm learning, well, what I've learned from this, and, and, and certainly, you know, this is ongoing, is that while our numbers may be very small, our contribution, our impact on the field seems to be most prevalent within our professional organizations that the professional organizations might be the tool that we use to have, uh, uh, if you will, to change the trajectory of our field. And, and last but not least, the importance of having uh, allies. And particularly within APA, a humongous organization, uh, much larger than um, ACSP, um, the importance of having allies when we go through these conservative, if you will, moments. The report that I shared with you that had Rodney Proctor, um, David Off, and, uh, and uh, Barrett, Carol Bennett on it. One of the points that they emphasized was the need to have appointed representatives to the board to ensure that all segments of, of planning um, are accounted for. Um, but they also talked about in the salary, I think it's called the salary survey, so the surveys of the field, that they include race and gender. And at the time when Paul Farmer was president of APA, uh, the decision was made to remove the data, collecting data with regards to race. So this state we really can't give you official data. Uh, the argument was made that, well, you know, there's so many different responses uh, that the data would be corrupted and, and certainly limited. And to the best of my knowledge, um, you know, that data point has not been entered back, has not been put back into the survey. So the importance of having allies and, and, and 
certainly working collectively, um, intergroup, you know, and intragroup um, is, is really important. Thank you for your time and attention.